thanks everybody for joining us. Uh, this is our ongoing series of community conversations that the Sierra Club chapter holds uh, on Wednesday nights, and we're glad you made it. I see a lot of people who are on the call tonight have been at previous calls, and that's great. Um, we have an interesting discussion tonight with uh, Senator Chris Pearson and Representative Laura Sevilla, who have both been very involved in different uh, bills in the legislature that relate to climate this time around. And we know that the in this unusual year, the legislature is coming back into session um, in about a week, a week, uh, and and on the 25th, and and so uh, what we're going to talk about tonight is. Uh, what's in store? What are the things to look for? What what are the high stakes bills that are that are out there? And we're really lucky to have a couple of people that have been very involved in this. Um, and what I'd like to do is maybe sort of the 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 big item that is out there that a lot of people have heard about is the Global Warming Solutions Act. And it turns out that Laura Sibili is the vice chair of the committee that did a ton of work on this. So we're really glad she's here tonight. So Laura, I wonder if Representative Sibili, I wonder if you would be able to fill us in on what the, that act is about and, and what, you, what your hopes are for that. Well, sure. Thank you um, very much. And uh, I'm really happy to be here tonight. And I'm really happy to be here with Senator Pearson, um, the Climate Caucus, um, the work that they did um, leading into last session was really extraordinary. Um, and in terms of building momentum and knowledge and understanding to um, get this bill passed, um, it was, it was something else. So uh, we came in, uh, my chair, I'm sorry that he's not able to be here this evening, um, Representative Tim Briglin, um, you know, he spent months prior to the session, um, you know, also working uh, as the Climate Caucus was working. We were talking, meeting with uh, advocates and, and others about <clears throat> the best way to take this bill. It had been introduced in the previous session um, it was a carbon copy, I believe, of the Massachusetts bill. And there were a few elements of, of the original um, language that were put in that just were not going to work in Vermont. So there was a lot of work going into the session, um, you know, building some consensus. <clears throat> and what we ended up with um, was um, a very large council um, representative of um, a number of uh, groups in Vermont um, that, uh, that are particularly vulnerable, um, looking, uh, charging this council with putting together a plan. And uh, the plan would be to help us hit our emissions goals, but also um, to really protect, to protect Vermonters. And I think a lot of times that aspect of climate change work gets lost. Um, and we don't necessarily help people understand and see the connection to their life. Um, I represent rural Vermont, and you know one of my other passions is telecommunications. And you know I can see what has happened in rural Vermont without adequate thought and thinking um, about modernizing that kind of infrastructure. Um, so as we're having to adjust for climate change and having to modernize our energy infrastructure. Um, it was, it's really important to me that rural Vermont in particular um, not be left behind and that we have a good plan to um, protect all of our Vermonters and modernize our infrastructure and be able to hit those targets. So uh, we put together this plan working um, to, to build this council, put together the plan to meet these energy targets um, and uh, and there is a cause of action in there. The cause of action ends up being something that makes folks, um, that draws a lot of opposition. Um, I really want to credit Tim, uh, Representative Briglin, uh, for the work that he did to really sort that out and make it something that was um, both meaningful and, and, and easy for folks to understand. Um, you know, the cause of action at this point is, did you, did you put forward a plan um, that can help us achieve the goals. Um, if you didn't, there's a cause of action, you know, put forward a plan. And, and is that plan meeting the goals? It's not, okay. The cause of action is 
bring us another plan. Let's try again, or let's modify that plan, or, or is it possible to modify that plan? So <clears throat> at a super high level, um, I'm going to go right ahead and assume, Steve, that folks have um, more detail about, um, about the bill. I'm happy to um, you know, wade in a little bit, but uh, we passed it with um, a tripartisan um, passage in the House. I'm going to be in big trouble for not knowing the uh, vote count. Uh, I think it was 108. No, 100. Uh, yeah. And yeah. it was a lot. It was a lot. It was actually, um, it felt really good. It felt like people really understood um, the, the questions, the arguments uh, on the floor were um, they're high level. It was folks were really engaged in the discussion, so we passed it. We sent it over um, to the Senate, and then um, and then COVID hit. Uh, so <clears throat> yeah, we were fortunate enough. And Chris could tell you maybe a little bit more about the journey uh, over in the Senate during the um, during the spring coronavirus session. Um, but it has it did pass the Senate <clears throat> by a lot, uh, and um, and is back in the House. Uh, the one uh, un, the one undone piece at this point is the funding uh, for getting this plan done. And so that's something that we're going to have to figure out yeah, in the upcoming September session. So I think I'll, I'll stop there. Is that? Perfect. Oh, that's great. Thank you. Thank you. I think that's uh, sometimes the, I think the, the bill is undersold because, because, people don't realize how important that part was that you're talking about, the, the, uh, the aspect of, you know, taking care of rural Vermonters, uh, many of whom are right in the direct path of climate impacts and are often overlooked. So, uh, you know, it's a, a, the, that Climate Council, I think, is a, is a big deal. And one of the one of the interesting things about it is that uh, depending on when it's passed, I mean the way it's written now is that it, when it when it is passed, there are sixty days in which to appoint the council. Right, it's pretty aggressive. The the current legislature appoints the council, two thirds of the council. Okay. Pretty pretty aggressive timelines in there for sure. Um, but you know we we are it's a pretty urgent situation, so. Um, so we're, we're, we're making an assumption that a lot of you who are on the uh, call tonight are f pretty familiar. Pro as I look around the, the, the uh, list of people here, I think a lot of you have been on our calls discussing this in the past. So, well, why don't we uh, go over to Senator Pearson. Uh, if people have questions, please feel free to type them into the chat. And, uh, you know, in a, in, in a few minutes when uh, Senator Pearson has had a chance to spell out some of the other issues that are coming up, um, you know, we'll, we'll, you know, if you want to raise your hand or something, we can look around, but we hope to have a, a good, robust conversation here. So, Senator Pearson, uh, yeah. do you have anything to add on, on the Solutions Act or do you want to review some of the other things that are well, on the table? Let me, let me just build quickly on on a few points uh, Representative Sibelia offered. Um, and I think most of you will know them, but it's worth repeating just because we really need your help talking to all sorts of Vermonters about these, uh, these priorities that we're pushing in Montpelier. And as she mentioned, we still do need to finish the work on that bill, particularly to make sure that the council is funded so the work can happen. Um, Backing up the need for planning and the need for uh, hitting these targets. First of all, the bill does also itemize the targets, to setting emission reduction goals at Paris levels early in the early years and ultimately pushing all the way to net zero by 2050, which matches what New York and Maine and Massachusetts have done in recent years. Um, but underscoring the need for this uh, is the fact that Vermont actually is falling behind our neighbors. We are um, per capita, the, we have a higher per person uh, uh, greenhouse gas emissions compared to New England. And we have actually reduced our emissions uh, 
less than others, least of all, I guess you'd say, um, if you're looking back over the last several years compared to all of New England. So we like to think that, you know, we're doing well in Vermont and we have some leadership for sure in renewable energy, energy efficiency. But uh, pound for pound, we are emitting more greenhouse gas emissions, green, uh, global warming solution, uh, global warming gases than our neighbors. So we really do need to get this and we need to get it moving uh, yesterday. Um, the, the grassroots pressure uh, that, that all of you have been part of has been really instrumental. Uh, during the House vote, <clears throat> some Republicans that supported it explained their vote this way, something I'll paraphrase, but they basically said, I don't love this bill, but I refuse not to do anything. And I think that's extremely powerful. And that is a shift that I'm seeing in the last, over the last year as Australia burned and Greta sailed across the ocean and the, the general awareness of the climate crisis uh, got elevated, the political response is starting to shift. That's really instrumental. We got, as, as Representative Sibelius said, a robust over 100 votes in the House. We got, in the end, 24 out of 30 senators, tripartisan in both chambers, voting for this. And the governor has noticed that. And the governor sent recently a letter that explained some of his concerns with the accountability provision in particular, where, where a citizen can step up and say to state leaders, you're not doing enough, I'm taking you to court. And there's, there's a lot of protections in here people need to understand. There's no frivolous lawsuits. There's not lawyers getting thousands and thousands of dollars. It's very tightly framed. But like the Clean Water Act at the federal level gives citizens a voice that is ultimately pushing Vermont to do the work to clean up Lake Champlain and other waterways, similarly, this has a citizen accountability provision that's really, really important. So those are just a couple factors I wanted to make sure people knew. The Climate Solutions Caucus, which I'm proud to be a co-founder of and currently co-chair with Representative Sarah Copeland Hansis from over in Bradford. We have um, been pushing a lot of bills. Many of you I th see from the list joined us in the fall and winter as we went around the state and talked to interested people about these issues. And we, we elevated several issues, transportation, energy and renewables, the Global Warming Solutions Act and accountability, uh, the Transportation Climate Initiative, and also workforce development. COVID certainly interrupted our momentum. All of those were moving in some fashion early on. We're left with three of the five now. Um, but workforce um, development is, is moving. It passed the Senate, uh, S-220, passed the Senate, well, I don't know, in May, I think, and is, and is expected to be taken up. And I just want to explain that bill because it's, it's not gotten the attention in the media, but it's, it's got some significant pieces. What it contemplates is licensed professionals that work in the state that already get a license, if they're an electrician or a plumber, which does HVAC, or a, real, uh, a retail, uh, realtor, excuse me, excuse me, my cat is bugging me, um, or an appraiser, all of these professions get licensed through the state, most of them through the Secretary of State. And what we're trying to do in S220 is bring them into the climate challenge that we're all hoping to address. Many of these professions are directly involved. Um, certainly an HVAC person helps you choose a new heating system or a, an appraiser needs to figure out how do we value your solar panels on your house when it comes up for resale? How do we value the fact that you've insulated your home and now it's much more energy efficient when you put it up for sale? Um, how, does, uh, how do professionals make sure that they're telling you, for instance, that your utility might give you a grant to help you pay for a heat pump or to switch over uh, to an electric vehicle, things like this. The state has a bunch of programs. In many cases, they're direct grants or tax credits, et cetera. But the professions that are in fact helping us make these decisions haven't been totally looped in. And since we're touching these professionals and licensing them as a state every two years, what we're trying to set up is a curriculum so that they're aware of the programs, so that they are frankly part of 
bringing forward the solutions. These are professionals that uh, interact with thousands of Vermonters in our homes every day, which is our most significant investment for most people and one of our biggest energy um, drains in our homes. So I, I am actually very excited about that bill. It did pass the Senate um, and, and it's now in House government operations. And so we're hopeful that that will move forward. Another bill, and I'm going to forget the number, Rob, maybe you can help me, but I think it's S-237, is the all fuels efficiency shift. As people know, Efficiency Vermont has been wildly successful, saved Vermonters lots of money. Uh, we're using less electricity than when Efficiency Vermont started in 2000. But we have narrowly... Um, uh, permitted efficiency Vermont to only work on electricity efficiency. And right now we don't really need that as much as we need fossil fuel efficiency. And we're starting in this bill to widen their scope. They have tremendous knowledge. There are literally people at efficiency Vermont that go around the world helping others um, do something similar, set up their own efficiency utilities. And, and they do have knowledge about fossil fuels, but we've really curtailed how much they can put into that work. And, and this bill starts to contemplate how do we transition them to help us with transportation and building efficiency, which is really our big needs and our big greenhouse gas emitters. Um, so those are two bills that have survived despite the pandemic. And uh, we're hopeful we'll get to the governor, governor's desk uh, when we uh, continue session here in, in next week, which is by the way, unheard of. We, I've never met beyond uh, mid-June, really, in the legislature. Very unusual time, but but this is where we find ourselves. So I think I'll leave it there, unless you have direct questions, Steve. I'd love to hear questions from everybody else. Well, uh, I, we did, uh, let's see, I'm, I'm scanning to see if Scott is with us. Yes, Scott's here. Um, Scott Weathers happens to be with us tonight. Scott has just written a great column that I've seen uh, that he's going to share with some of the uh, publications around the state on the uh, uh, public health planning aspects of climate change. I think that's S 185, if I'm not mistaken, Scott. You want to, Scott? Do you want to share a little bit about that and then, and uh, and what you see as the uh, value of that effort? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely, Steve. Thanks. And uh, keep your fingers crossed it gets accepted and published. So, you know, you, you spoke a little too soon. We'll, we'll see what happens. But, um, but yeah, the, the bill is uh, S-185. You know, it was uh, uh, the lead author is Ginny Lyons. Um, it's honestly a pretty straightforward bill. Um, I think, you know, some of the pieces of legislation that uh, uh, Senator, Senator Pearson and Representative Sibelia just talked about are a little bit more complex and, and probably, uh, you know, a little more critical, but I think that this S-185 is a really great step in the right direction. Basically, what it would do is, is it would ask the Department of Health uh, to author a report uh, in collaboration with several other entities to prepare for the long-term public health consequences of climate change. Um, in particular, you know, to pay attention to uh, numerous vulnerable communities that are gonna be particularly hard hit by the public health ramifications of climate change. Um, so a pretty straightforward bill. It's it's been uh, it, it passed through the Senate, I believe, in in May or June, um, and uh, and, and is, is on to the House right now. Um, so excited to potentially see some action on that. Um, and and obviously, uh, you know, I, I think it's it's hard to to speculate as to exactly what the results of that report would would be, but. Uh, but since there are so many long-term public health ramifications of climate change, um, it seems like a pretty important uh, piece of legislation to support. So, yeah. yeah, that's a pretty quick summary. Yeah, great. Thanks so much. And I guess it wouldn't it wouldn't be uh, we couldn't we couldn't completely uh, walk out of here without have without mentioning the fact that the enormous uh, Act 250 reform bill has some climate implications as well. There's a lot of other controversial areas to that bill, but climate is in there too. And I know that was one of the big uh, reasons to initiate that whole effort. I don't know if you have, I, I don't know if uh, Senator Pearson or Representative Sibili, if you've had a chance to, to, uh, to dig into that, it's a complex uh, volume. Uh, do, you have, do you have anything to share on that or we, we might just have to skip that for tonight. 
Well, it's currently in the Senate, so and Senator Pearson probably has a better sense of what's possible at this point with that. Yeah, it's been linked in in our discussion to um, some housing work, um, and so I, I I'm not on that relevant committee, but in and I think it's sort of a pared down version of what the House had worked on for the last year and a half. Um, the short story, the way I think of it is trying to update Act 250 a little bit to recognize that we ought to make it easier to develop in our downtowns and a little harder to develop maybe in the more rural places where there's a, a sensitive watersheds or, or what have you. Um, so that trade-off. Uh, there's also trail provisions in there, which has been confusing in Act 250. It's not a slam dunk um, from the climate perspective. It's been an uneasy alliance between um, different folks who, who follow this more closely, our partners at VNRC and others. Um, so I, I, I don't know that we should claim it as a victory, but there are some elements of it that are quite important. And of course, our land use is a big, uh, a big dynamic for climate and something that we ought to take advantage of here in Vermont, uh, having a lot of open land and undeveloped land and uh, it's a good carbon sequestration strategy. So we got to keep our eye on how we're developing. Well, let me remind everybody that uh, we're open for questions here. Uh, feel free to uh, enter your questions in chat or, or just go into chat and, and let us know that you have a question and we'll go to you to ask your question. Uh, yeah. Yes. yes. So may I respond um, to one thing that Scott had said um, with regard to the bill and talking about um, the plan uh, for public health, um, really critical. But one of the things that I heard him say and that we really tried to, tried to get better about uh, how we talked about was this notion that it will be a public health crisis or that is coming, or climate change is coming. And we really worked very hard um, in the House when we were talking about this bill to say that it is here. And the public health crisis is here. And I think it's important um, not to scare people, um, but just to help people, you know, accept, you know well, this, this is a problem we have to deal with now. We actually don't have any more time to wait. So um, I just wanted to, I think language is important, particularly in things that end up being really contentious and political and a lot of kind of misinformation or sound bites put out there. It's important to be intentional about language. And that is one of the intentional pieces. It's here now. So thanks for letting me just share that. Yeah, thanks for that. Thanks for that. It, uh... There are, there are so many dimensions of the climate change transition that we're, we have begun that, uh, that we will have to get used to. Uh, so, so Steve, I'm, uh, I'm gonna, I, I, I have a question here that I was gonna ask them, everybody, because I don't know if a lot of people who are following this understand what else is happening within the legislative cycle. This session was originally designed, as my impression is, to, re to review all the finances coming in to make sure that we're able to pass a particular budget. So I know that's the number one priority of the legislature. But while we have had all these other issues come up, we had, there's a huge racial justice issue uh, that's sprouted up all across the country. And I know there's some criminal justice reform bills, use of force bills going on there. You, you, both of you, I know you, that's not your uh, jurisdiction, but if there's anything you want to just inform our audience on that, because that's an important area the Sierra Club is looking at, not just addressing climate, uh, looking at how people are and are all members of society are treated. So if you have anything else to say around that, it's appreciated. Well, um, Yes, <laughs> they are underway. Um, as it happens, you know, in the Senate, there's 30 of us. So working remotely by Zoom, you know, the, the, this is uh, about a little bit under what the floor session looks like than what the discussion we're having. So we were able to move 
much faster. We were much more nimble than the house uh, a little bit. So in session, very much more so remotely. Imagine this Zoom call with 150 people um, with a lot of opinions. So um, we did manage to get started on some of the racial justice work on some of the police reform work and sent bills over to the House uh, in June, right uh, bef shortly before adjourning. Also, you made reference, Rob, because the economy is so hard to predict right now, and because the federal response around COVID has been changing and very hard to predict as well. What we did for normally by July 1st, we are forced to pass a, an annual budget for the coming year. What we did this year was pass a quarter, one quarter, uh, which ends at the end of September. So we now are going back to do a three quarters budget. Because of that lag, we had an opportunity, particularly around the, the question of police funding and moving resources maybe away from law enforcement to mental health or what have you. So uh, part of what we did in that, that process was said, come back by the end of August so next week with a plan of how we should divert resources from law enforcement officers to mental health response and, and like that. So that work will continue. Um, also some uh, expungement of criminal records related to drug offenses, things like that. A lot of, I mean, this is not, I'm proud that we were able to respond to the call that, that everybody had around George Floyd and the horrific reality of us finally having to digest that as a country. But the reality is the Vermont legislature has been addressing these things in different ways for many years, whether it's public oversight of police, whether it's different criminal uh, criminal justice, uh, sentencing reform, the way we handle youth incarceration, on and on and on. We have been racial collecting racial data on law enforcement. Uh, for instance, we've been doing that for years. Now we're saying, if you're an agency that's not doing that, we're going to cut your funding. You know, so we're putting more teeth on it. But this has been underway for many, many years, but I'm glad that we were also able to jump on it and take advantage of some of the grassroots support that helped us out. Yeah. And we did pass um, in the in the June session uh, S-219, which banned chokeholds and um, mandated body cameras uh, for the state police. And I know, and that was unanimous in the House. I think it was pretty high in the Senate. Um, and I know that there are our Judiciary Committee has also been having, um, and I don't know if it's been joint with the Senate, I have to imagine it probably has been, um, but there have been uh, three public hearings um, in the last uh, couple of weeks, there may be one more that's coming up around additional um, police reforms that may be needed or thoughts that they aren't needed. Um, so that, that work is still ongoing. Great, thanks. Um, we have a question uh, from Scott. I, I wonder if uh, Representative Sibili, I know this is something you worked on a fair amount. Scott, do you want to voice that question? Yeah, I mean, I'm just curious to hear how the legislature basically decides between sectors. Obviously, uh, you know, one simple way is just to, in terms of reducing carbon emissions, obviously one simple way is just to look at uh, which sectors are responsible for the greatest fraction of emissions. But uh, kind of, I assume, you know, beyond that, the legislature has a process for uh, thinking through how to most effectively reduce carbon emissions. And I'd be interested to hear uh, y'all share about that process. Uh, well, so we'll definitely want to get Senator Pearson in here as well. Um, I'm not sure that the, that the legislature um, is actually um, great at getting down to that, exactly what are the sectors, um, but you know, building that box, um, requiring that plan, which is what the Global Warming Solutions Act is. It says, here's our goals. You must put together a group of experts. They must put together a plan. And, you know, it needs to consider these varying factors. Um, a lot of times when you're, when, when the legislature does start choosing, it's, you know, who's, who's, we're, we're the squeaky wheels. So, uh, you know, we're the best arguers, as the case might be. Senator Pearson, you, I'm sure, would add to that. Yeah, I mean... I wish that we had a better process and I wish that it was more driven by logic as, as your question seems so straightforward and, and to have to be frank with you and say, we don't have that process. Um, we have over the past many years 
done things like a comprehensive energy plan. So trying to figure out, okay, where do we want to be in terms of energy generation in the state in five years and 10 years and 50 years? That's a piece of it. Um, but as we all know, the, the biggest single source of emissions in Vermont is transportation. And we're a rural state. Um, and, and that is a real trick. Uh, that's why I've been very uh, interested in the Transportation Climate Initiative. Uh, people probably know this is an agreement um, that's under discussion right now uh, with the 12 northeastern states from Maine over to New York down to through DC into Virginia. This is, uh, I think, uh, about a third of the country's economy represented here. And, and in transportation, you know, any, any decisions we make, um, it, it's just gonna, it's so much more likely to succeed if we're working in concert with other states and, and not have to put Laura and I in a question of saying, well, why should we do this if New Hampshire's not gonna play ball? You know, that is a politically very difficult question, especially when there's a cost involved. Um, and and you got to recognize that for rural folks, for families with a low income, you know, they're not buying an electric car anytime soon. And, and so the transportation options are fairly limited. But um, but so, so the Global Warming Solutions Plan and Act is the idea of really doing that analysis and coming up with uh, strategy. That's, that's it. Otherwise, it's been sort of ad hoc where we, we, we have invested a lot of weatherization because that's straightforward. Well, how do you deal with buildings? Well, you insulate them better. Well, where do we have the money? Well, we have this much money. Okay, let's do it. Well, we got some federal money. Good. Add it to that, you know. And meanwhile, transportation's been largely unchecked. Um, recently, we have added more and more in transportation in the T-bill, the so-called transportation bill looks at investing in bike ped infrastructure and in, in park and rides. You know, these are, these are pretty low hanging fruit. Um, in the last year, we've started doing direct subsidies for electric cars. We've done more trans, uh, charging infrastructure and we've set up a program to help uh, lower income families get into a more efficient vehicle, not necessarily all the way to electric, but, but putting away the old clunker and getting, you know, a hybrid or used hybrid. Those are, those are meaningful steps and, and, help to address some of the inequality issues that, that arise around um, viable climate friendly solutions. You know, one thing I, I would add to that is that uh, in, in the Global Warming Solutions Act, you've set up a, a set of, you know, you set up this climate council, but within that you have these subcommittees and there are four of them set up, they can add more, but one of the four I, th I think three of the four are more or less in the resilience area and adaptation, but one of them is about cross-sector mitigation. And so they and the council in general are charged with developing a plan to kind of do exactly what you're asking, Scott, in terms of uh, you know, all these different things, whether it's transportation, mitigation, you know, reduction through that, reduction through weatherization, reduction through making sense of our complicated and, and uh, sometimes dysfunctional uh, incentives for renewables, all those things. Uh, th these, this, this subcommittee is going to be charged with creating that plan, pretty much exactly what you've asked. So, uh, so we have uh, a question from uh, Richard, and, and I'm going to disappear for a minute, but Richard, uh, you've got a question about uh, uh, Representative Gina's bill. Yeah, I, I called it up here. Uh, I was talking to Pastor Thomas uh, a couple of weeks ago, and he mentioned H478. Uh, the Vermont bill on apology and proposal for reparations. And I just wonder, I haven't heard anything about that. I wonder if either of you have any sense of uh, whether that's getting any traction. So uh, I'm looking at, so it's a house bill. It has not left the house and I 
I actually am not familiar with the bill, so I will leave. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I'm not aware of that conversation in the Senate. Uh, I, you know, these are, I mean, that was a big bill even before a pandemic. Um, yeah. To contemplate. yeah. I'm just kind of going back to Rob's uh, question about uh, racial equity and so on. And the bill is there. Uh, there is a bill. Yes. So, Richard, to answer your question on that, the Social Equity Caucus has been talking about that particular policy and kind of linked to the exact, almost, almost the exact same language was passed in the city of Burlington's resolution from a couple of weeks ago. So they're going to create a process to review this. And it's kind of also modeled off of some federal legislation, which, you know, is not going to go anywhere anytime soon. Uh, but at least the, the concept is moving along. And the city of Burlington has been looking into that and the, it is being discussed in some circles within the legislative leaders, but as uh, representative uh, Sibelia or, or Senator Pearson can't be on every single zoom call <laughs> every minute and it's not having the, the, the full effect. So, but I think that's something that will be taken up next year. You mean they can't know everything? <laughs> I expect Chris to do that. Yeah. <laughs> Could we talk about that ag question? It was. Oh, let's see. From I, yes. Henry. I, I think I skipped the ag question. I missed it. Go ahead. Uh, who, who has asked that question? It was Henry, I think. Henry. Henry, do you want to voice your question? You're on mute now. Sure. <clears throat> yes. The, so the question is, uh, uh, is there a path for the future? I realize it's probably not existing now to either pay people for echo services rendered or to pay people for perhaps soil improvement that would uh, filter and reduce pollution, both of which are expenses for the government and and the uh, carbon capture that happens with that will help offset our warming, which is really why we're trying to get the CO2 down. Yeah, I, 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 I love this question. That's why I'm glad, glad to Henry brought it forward. I, I serve as the vice chair of the Senate Ag Committee. Um, and I actually am more and more convinced that agriculture is uh, got to be front and center in Vermont's answer to the climate crisis. And is, is actually a very exciting potential that I don't think we have had much dialogue about as a state. Um, and the, the, the concept that Henry's talking about is something that the legislature is pursuing a year ago uh, a year and a half ago, we set up a, a working group made up of farmers of, from different watersheds and other water experts to come forward to explore this idea. And the idea is um, if we can build soil and the organic matter in soil, you do a lot of, you have a lot of benefits. One of them is flood resilience. One of them is a reduction of runoff. Um, and one of them is carbon sequestration. These are win-win-wins. And of course we know we're getting about seven inches more of rain every year in Vermont. This is one of the impacts of, of the climate warming. Um, and not only are we getting more rain, but we're getting intense rainstorms as we all have lived through. And so that creates a bigger flooding problem. And it in fact creates bigger flood and drought cycles. And if you have healthy soils, you actually can weather those cycles better farms hold on to water when there's droughts, they don't have the runoff uh, when there is intense flooding. Um, and so the idea is that this is valuable to the community and could the community say, basically pay farmers for this service. And I was talking to a farmer about this and I said, I don't know, it's such a new idea. And could we really get this going? He said, We've been paying farmers for ecosystem services for a long time. We've just been paying them for one, and that's producing milk. Um, but, but so if we broaden the way we think of this, um, there's great potential. And farmers, what I'm excited about is farmers are engaged themselves about this. And it has everything to do with clean water. 
and carbon sequestration. And by the way, when you have healthy soil, you get a better crop yield. So how, why we have to pound our heads against the wall to get this logical thing moving, I don't know. But we are moving it forward. We are extending that working group. The, the way you measure building soil and organic matter in soil in a, in a very precise way that could be teed up or, or linked up with a remuneration with payment is not not understood broadly and we got to really figure that out before we start talking to vermonters about really really coming up with money and recognizing it's not just a pretty landscape that we're getting here from our farmers but that there's much more to it i'm very excited about this if you can't tell i think there's great potential for our rural economy for our flagging flagging uh farm economy and for the ecosystem services that it could bring our, our entire state yeah, I mean, the only thing I would add, I would just I wouldn't even add I would just underscore I think you're absolutely right, Chris. The work that's been going on with um, the clean water has really naturally kind of is feeding right into um, the work that will happen here. So we're we're in it. I think I would I would point to uh, Rob's comment there in the chat that where uh, we we did have a discussion about this. Uh, uh, not long ago, and that's uh, he's got a link to that archive discussion, Henry, if you want to follow that up. Uh, and we, we are planning one uh, to show up in about a month on uh, carbon sequestration in forests. So another very similar question. I want to go to Jack Cushman right now. He's got a question about, uh, about money, I believe. Yes, indeed. And first, I want to thank you for uh, this really interesting and thorough presentation which is helping me a lot as I try to get our town select board to pass a simple resolution of support for the act. And uh, by doing that, I get the Conservation Commission on board and the Energy Committee on board and 20 people from Norwich will contact the governor. And uh, this is all helping me strengthen the case for a very, which is a very strong case. My concern is that as I understand it, the governor has now presented the new budget and it doesn't have any of the few hundred thousand dollars in it that you would need to do the work that this legislation calls for. Um, and of course, he hasn't said whether he'll sign uh, the legislation. Um, but does he, in effect, have a kind of a pocketbook veto here that if he just refuses to put money in? Can you explain the budgeting sure. process for me here? So the executive branch uh, always they always propose a budget to run the government because they're the ones that are that are tasked with running the government. So the governor will come in and say, uh, here's what I need to run the government. And of course, it reflects his priorities. Um, and then the next stop, that comes into the House. And then the House uh, takes hearings on that. They make changes. Um, they add some of their own priorities. They take testimony from the executive branch. Um, and then we'll pass a budget. And then we send it to the Senate. And that's the same, you know, same process. Um, and hopefully the um, executive branch is working with us all along. They, they typically are working with us all along. Um, and we get to a, a place where, you know, we all, we all agree. Um, I think it's, it's a little bit more than a couple hundred thousand. It's pretty close to a million with the Global Warming Solutions Act. It's a two-year budget. Um, and so... <clears throat> I think there is some, um, I'm not sure how that will be, how that will be resolved, but I would expect to see some flexing maybe around that um, to try and get everyone on board. Uh, I don't know if I've answered that or not, or if Chris maybe has something more to add. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess I would add that um, it doesn't surprise me that the governor's not putting it in there. For one thing, it's not the law yet. So he kind of doesn't have to do it. And, if he put in the 800,000 or whatever it is, then he's got to take that out of somewhere else. And to give you a little flavor there, he also, I've learned, didn't uh, fund any of the bridge funding for the state colleges. Something that we broadly all agree we should do. It costs about $25 million. He just admits that. And so when Laura and friends in the house get down to work for the budget, they take his balanced budget, but it actually has a $25 million hole in it. So this is a game that all governors play. I, Peter Shumlin did the same thing. 
It is standard uh, in the in the uh, gamesmanship, if you like, of the executive branch versus the legislature. So you can't read into it. It's a standard tiring game, uh, but we will figure out there will be a lot of moving pieces. They're very skilled people writing our budgets. And, and uh, if it's a priority and the Speaker of the House in particular has made the Global Warming Solutions Act a priority. And so I would expect you'll see the resources uh, Freedom, so, um, but it but it, this, but it this, is a tough year. I mean, we shouldn't kid ourselves. It's really yes, and yeah. and it's easy to say, well, in a tough year like this, why don't we kick the can down the road for a year, and then you're one year right. closer to going over the cliff. Um, right. uh, I have to say, this sounds a lot like the way it's handled in Washington, where I spent my adult life watching budgets, and uh, uh, I think it's important for us to keep pushing on and pay for it whenever we have these idealistic or, or, or um, aspirational targets. Even a good bill like this won't mean anything, will it, if there's no money? That's right. That's right. Um, and I think that there's absolutely um, value and, and a need to weigh in and ask uh, that the bill be funded. Um, that's helpful for all of us. Um, and Jack, I would push back on your, this is like Washington. I think we're very, I think we're, you know, Vermont is not a hundred percent, you okay. know, super functional, but That's right. I think we do. Okay. <laughs> we do better. We do better do. Than, than most. You do. That's what we do. Yeah, that's, that, that, that's a low bar these days, but it is we, a also, low bar. <laughs> uh, we also can't print money. So um, we yeah. have to take that responsibility very seriously. I was, I'm old enough to remember when Washington was capable too. So let's, uh, I want to go to Susan Hodges, who has a question about uh, getting people involved. Susan, do you want to ask your question? Yes. Um, I, I live in South Stratford and we have a local climate action group and we've recently put out uh, people should call the governor and ask him to fund the Global Warming Solutions Act. I called today and left a message. Um, I, so that seems like one thing that people can do. Um, it's great to get some clarity on some of these other bills. What's been hard for, for me as an individual is to figure out what exactly I can ask people to do or, or put out there. So if you have suggestions of specific actions that just regular people like me can do that might help push these along. That would be great to hear. I definitely think we want to ask the governor to sign the bill once it, once it gets to him. Mm -hmm. But it isn't to him yet. So is it too it's soon? Not to him. No, so it's it not too soon to him. ask him. No, I think it's not too soon to ask him to, you know, to, you know, that it's an important bill. Um, I think a somewhat reasonable case could be made that, you know, we're in COVID, it's a state of emergency. You know, this is not 100% COVID related and, you know, is this something actually that we should be doing? I would say absolutely it is. Um, you know, we're, as we've talked about, we're already experiencing the effects of climate change. Um, my rural Vermont is already getting left behind in the transition. Uh, we cannot wait any longer. It's just another emergency on top of this. Um, but it's good to, um, you know, there will be a lot of push on the governor with that exact message that this is not the time. Um, so it would be helpful to give him a lot of support and push uh, for signing on to this. And, and this, you know, the speaker at, at, for, to fund it. Yeah, I, and I would just add, Susan, I, I think Representative Briglin is probably your representative. So oh, yeah. you, you have a very strong ally on this bill yeah. actually representing you. Um, but um, a couple of thoughts quickly. It, it never hurts to reach out to a legislator that already supports the position you're asking for. Oh, yes. Um, and, and the governor and your senator uh, and actually uh, – Mark McDonald, your senator, presented the bill on the floor, and he did a great job. 
uh, actually really made it possible for our strong vote. So I commend him. He's, he's a fun guy to work with. Very entertaining. Um, the, uh, the other thing though, as we're talking about Global Warming Solutions Act and, and this COVID dynamic and, and is it irresponsible? And you'll see, early, you'll see this in the papers and people will say, how oh, these, these fools in Montpelier, they're wasting their time. This is a planning bill. And our economy is in deep trouble. And typically when that happens, the federal government offers a stimulus. Now they haven't offered a stimulus. They've offered so far a relief package and they've thought about some other subsequent relief packages. When they come to stimulus, we want to be ready. We want to be ready. And so you remember shovel ready under the Obama stimulus? Mm -hmm. We want shovel ready retirement projects. And how are we going to do that if we haven't funded a proper planning process? So I think in addition to everything Representative Sibeli is saying about the crisis is upon us, which we all understand, there's an enormous opportunity to get ready for an economic recovery and stimulus that we can hope for and be ready to take advantage of. And that's not a bad message for people who maybe need a little nudge to do the right thing. Yeah. I also personally think that when, as the as climate change keeps on, it, it's just going to be a thousand times worse than COVID. We're going to look back at COVID and think, oh, this is a piece of cake compared to what we're looking at, which is one of the reasons why I acted on this. Thank you. Great. Are there more questions? Well, I, maybe uh, Senator Pearson, Representative Sebelia, you've answered all of the questions that there are. Well, Steve, I asked the questions, Brian Forrest. Brian, yes, please. Um, Montpelier has been experimenting with um, uh, micro transit. Uh, they've studied the amount of uh, space in town voted to parking and cars and, and they think that um, they can deal with, they can enhance the amount of uh, property they have for, for, for real estate and enhancing the quality of life in the city and reduce transportation if everyone didn't have to drive their car to town for, for a, uh, a, uh, an errand. And uh, their, their proposal is on-demand uh, transit services. And, uh, and Chris, I'm, I'm wondering whether the state is considering uh, more pilot projects like this to, as a possible uh, solution to not drive, everyone not driving their car to town. And I'd like to say one more thing that, that the budget is not a zero sum game. Uh, and the process is kind of backward. Instead of finding how much stuff we can shove into the budget under a limited budget, we should find out, first of all, what it is we need, have to have done and then figure out a budget to encompass those things. Well, those are big questions. Um, in terms of micro transit, I don't know that we're um, planning more pilots. The, the, the interesting thing I, the more I learn about the climate crisis is, you know, there's a temptation even in Montpelier to say, oh, we need Washington to handle this. And there's a temptation at the local level to say, we need Montpelier to handle this. There is no one that is without responsibility in this crisis. And the local community, as you're discussing Montpelier, Montpelier has done a good job too of, of district heat, of trying to explore more efficient systems that way. Up here in Burlington forever, we've been trying to get district heat going out of our electric uh, wood burning plant. Um, there are enormous opportunities for local, whether it's your energy committees are doing great things around the state. Um, we were talking about agriculture. There are some good examples there. There needs to be, my point is, uh, an across the board, <clears throat> I think Jack was talking about trying to get select board acting and speaking, but also there had been an effort in, in Norwich to um, bring their municipal buildings to net zero. We were in Bristol, Addison County last fall, and people were talking about, well, how can we invest 
you know, take my money out of, out of, uh, you know, T bills and put it into like solar array for all the town lights, you know, this kind of creative thinking is essential. And when it comes to microtransit, uh, you know, I think Montpelier could use a push from people locally who are interested in that. I will say that one of the things that uh, Tim Ash, who's been the pro tem of the Senate and member of the Transportation Committee, has been looking in, uh, which is a little bit related, not quite microtransit, but, but trying to work with bigger businesses and get them involved in the transportation challenges for their workers. And do we each need to drive a car to a giant parking lot to park there for eight hours a day? Or is there an opportunity to build some community, save some money and put people in a 15 person van and get their commute together for 10 minutes and, and, you know, just, create that new culture. There should be some opportunity there. So those are the kinds of things that I've heard more about rather than the microtransit example. But uh, across the board, the answer needs to be yes, how quick and who's got ideas. So actually, uh, we had a good discussion with Ross McDonald, the, the Agency of Transportation Public Transit Manager uh, two weeks ago on that particular topic and Dan Jones of Sustainable Mount Pillar. So that's actually available on our website as well. But actually I was in a conversation with, um, with Ross McDonald today and the agency actually does want to try to figure out more places to do pilot projects on microtransit. Uh, there was actually in last, uh, this transportation bill that was passed a few a month ago, uh, $500,000 to go towards pilot programs outside of Mount Pillar. Um, and as long as that money survives your budget now, uh, there is that. And that's what the agency would hope to lure some other communities to do a project like that outside of Mount Pillar. Um, and that actually is, is, uh, was, all the work of Senator Ash, uh, who actually got that switched into the transportation bill at the last minute. So just wanted to clarify that. So I'll just, I'll just point out a couple of uh, notes that were posted. Jack Cushman has posted a couple of things. One, one, a response that he got from the governor, which is, if you call that a response, it's, it's, it was a reply. And, uh, and then also he posted something uh, about the governor of Louisiana uh, issuing an executive order that sets <clears throat> pretty pretty close to identical targets to what the targets that are in our Global Warming Solutions Act for carbon reduction. So that's interesting. Henry, I see you have your hand up. Yeah, on the transportation side, I know that my mileage I drive has gone way down. I'm retired, but my mileage has gone way down with COVID. And COVID is challenging us to work from home and do internet. I wonder if there's a way of lubricating that process so that um, it would become part of how things worked and actually re reduce the, the miles, uh, miles commuted. Uh, Vermont has one of the highest uh, transportation miles per commuter of, of any state in the country. Any thoughts on that? <laughs> I have I have a few thoughts. Um, you know, as I I'm not sure where you're from, Henry, but um, I am from um, southern Vermont, um, very mountainous um, and pretty rural. I represent really rural towns, actually, um, and most of my rural towns are not connected. Um, you know, that's another initiative that Chris and I so spend quite it. a bit of time on. We're working on it. We're working <laughs> on it, but that's going to take a little time. So. I've been no, on I've, I've, I've been on the EC fiber board since it sure. started. So okay, oh okay, so you know, you know where <laughs> we know. are, and we're going to fix it, but it is going to take a little time. Um, but these roads, you know, these distances, you know, these little towns, um, re, I, I think we will see maybe commute times go down even more once COVID is done. You know, if if we are better connected. Um, in some of these little towns where folks can, um, you know, connect to larger economy. But a lot of my towns, it's not unheard of for folks to be driving 45 minutes to an hour, you know, for, for work. Statewide um, average, statewide average commute, I believe is 54 miles a day. The national yeah. average is 17. Yeah. 
And, you know, so I, I was listening to the microtransit ideas and we have to have those and they absolutely won't work in my, you know, in my little Reedsboro, you know, with the hill that goes like this. Um, we, we ended up, we got Senator Baruth um, all the way down to the most southernmost uh, school district in southern Vermont. He arrived, uh, we were trying to get him to agree to let them collaborate with a town in, in Massachusetts, which is just adjacent. He had previously said no, and he got there and he said, I'm convinced the topography has convinced me it's coming down Route 9, the mountains are very steep. Anyway, um, and long. So, <clears throat> Chris? Well, I, I mean, yes. Uh, and and we, we did try as we were uh, able to spend the CARES money, this is the federal COVID relief money, to have them do double duty. And, and so, for instance, building what I call climate friendly infrastructure like broadband. Uh, it's not been easy under the, the, um, the requirements of the federal process, but uh, is something we're trying really hard to do um, and, and getting people acclimated to working from home. Maybe they just do that one day a week, you know, maybe um, folks have been talking about reclaiming some streets so that your uh, restaurant can sit out there. And, and sort of questioning the sanctity of uh, the, the car infrastructure. You know, there are definitely some positives coming out of the community that, uh, that I see out of the COVID crisis, but um, it'll be up to all of us to build on that. So, so what I'm thinking is, is that a lot of businesses have figured out how to do distance uh, work. And some of those businesses just on their own will um, um, will carry on and do it. But I'm thinking if you could have a think tank, if you could do something that, that businesses could learn from businesses, uh, individuals who have, who have uh, stopped, stopped commuting because of COVID, um, how, do you, how do you generate a network where, where the network learns from that? I'm wondering if there's could be a uh, so, some kind of a state ombudsman or someone who would who would help in that training process. Uh, so you certainly see it in education. The educators don't, the the teachers don't know um, how how to teach online, and so they're scared of it, and for good reason. I mean, it's it's a whole a whole other set of uh, of skills. I, I think that, uh, you know, I keep reading that people are figuring this out, right? In some places, probably not everybody. And I think that's probably part of your point is that some people have the ideas and, and uh, if, if we can take some of these uh, best practices and, you know, genius ideas that people develop and share them around, uh, certainly uh, we've all figured out how to use Zoom in the last few months. So, and I, and I think, I think I've, I've even read that there are plenty of businesses that are discovering that they are saving a lot of money by having their employees work from home. And if they could build that into their needs for space, in the long run, they could save even more. Well, we are very much at the end of our hour here. And I want to put out a big thanks to Representative Sebelius and Senator Pearson for joining us tonight and everybody else who's joined us. This has been a great discussion. 